Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at earsports.com, part of the CBS Sports Podcast Network. I am Mike Casaza here to talk about, well, naturally, college basketball. Flavor of the day, all anybody wants to hear about. That's why you press play on the podcast. Of course, to help me out, Chris Anderson. Chris, one game down, 30 to go in the regular season. We don't know what's going to happen. We knew for sure that the Mountaineers would win on Monday night. Sure enough, the Mountaineers of West Virginia, 76. The Mountaineers of Mount St. Mary's, 58. I have some funny visuals I can share with you at the end about the point spread and how mad people were. <laughs> um, but good news. Beginning of a new season. Some contributions from people that maybe you were curious about. Would they play? What would they look like? A lot of the season is going to be experimentation and development, but off on the right foot here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it it looked a lot like what we are accustomed to seeing from this WVU team. Like, you know, there was nothing stunning, nothing different from maybe what you've grown to know about a Bob Huggins squad. Uh, there were a lot of missed shots. There was a very slow start for both teams. Um I'm not confident in much of anybody shooting three right now, but they crashed the boards hard. They uh, got, I mean, got a lot of op- second opportunities because of that. I mean, the offensive rebounding was fantastic. Um, I know there was a little bit of a size advantage with Mount St. Mary's, but defense was excellent. Uh, you just got to kind of shield your eyes from the turnovers. A lot of them, I think there were 10 in the first half. Um, but that's uh, Huggins, you know, Huggins even admitted it before the season. He said, the, talking about the turnover, he said, the ball moves, it just doesn't go to guys, like indicating that guys are going to the wrong spots or just having some issues gelling because it's so many new guys. But it, it was, I, I want to say it was a positive day. Like if I, you win, it's always positive when you win. But I would say that maybe, you know, quick overreaction. I feel slightly better about this team hmm. after the game. Than maybe I did before. Are you in the same boat? No. Ooh, good. Oh, good, good, good. Here, my approach on this is I just don't know what they have and who they have. For example, I did not accept, expect to see Trey Mitchell. So I don't know how you can get an accurate picture of, of what it's going to look like when a guy who maybe wasn't supposed to play but hadn't practiced all of a sudden he's out there playing 14 minutes and taking seven shots, getting 13 points and running some offense and having some offense run through him. Also, the 6'5 guard out there who's going to be here, I guess, in December now, it sounds like, who's going to play, and that's going to displace somebody here. So I'm in such a TBA mode with this team purposefully because I, I really think the story of the season here is going to be how they – how they get themselves first ready for the start of Big 12 play and then ready for postseason play, provided they get there and they handle the first task the right way. But I just don't think that what you see is what you get right now versus later. But to your point, immediately, I don't know, man. I still have to go fill the ballot box, so to speak, here. I just I just am not sure about if they want to be different. I'm not sure they are going to be different or that they accomplished what they wanted to do which means do they have better parts to do what they've always done? I can't clearly say that yet. So here's why I'm, because it, it, it's not all positive. I, I didn't like mm-hmm. watch this game and be like, this is this is an obvious NCAA tournament team, or you know, this is a team that's going to compete for the Big 12 or whatever. But I, when you watch a Bob Huggins team, oh yeah, at least they'll always play defense and they'll always rebound. Well, guess what? They didn't do either of those things last year. Mm-hmm. They haven't done the defense part for a couple years now. They didn't do the rebounding part at all last year. They finished ninth in the Big 12 in rebounding. And I think uh, I had the stat the other day, 312th out of 350 teams uh, in, in Division One basketball. They, they they were terrible rebounding the basketball. And part of that is because you know their defense was so bad that the other team was shooting a high percentage of shots. So it's just a... A, a lose lose there with those two stats and i felt like what i saw yesterday again they didn't address the shooting woes at all and for me personally i didn't think they i mean i think they wanted to but they certainly didn't because the guys they added were not 
three point shooters, guys coming in that have 40% or whatever. These are just guys that also shot 30%. You replaced, you replaced guys who shot 30% with guys who shot 30%. So I'm expecting the same on the shooting, but it's like they doubled down on the, no, 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 we're going to play defense and we're going to rebound. And it looked like they could do that yesterday. Granted, Mount St. Mary's, so it is what it is. But they were crashing the boards hard. I think they were they were doubling up Mount St. Mary's on on the the glass for a good portion of the game. I thought the defense was suffocating. So that was a positive sign. I think if you could double down and at least be good on defense and rebounding, you're a competent team that's not going to finish last in the Big 12 Conference. Is that, is that a glow? Is that a glowing review? Um, someone's got to finish not dead last. Someone's got to finish ninth and tenth in that conference. Um, which, is it TCU who was losing to? Who, <laughs> did they? I, can, I don't even know the name of the team that they lost to last night. Like it, it is the team that I have never even or team that I've never even heard of before. Arkansas Pine Bluff. Oh, excuse me. I have heard of them. Yeah, be kind. Not in in glowing reviews, however. Again, like I just I can't believe TCU is going to be that blah for a season. Oh, yeah, I, so I, they I did win the game. Sorry, correct. They, they were down by like twenty at one point. Oh, I have a note for you on that. We'll get to it. But okay, my point being, I, they're better than that. And I, West Virginia is. How about this, Chris? They had some good indicators in this game, which I can get to, and and to some extent played the way that I think they want to play. Was it as polished, as refined, as crisp? No. But I wonder if at their peak this season, you look at a box score and it's very different than this. How about that? Mm-hmm. Because he shot 49%. That, that, that may not be a regular occurrence, right? But second half, 58% and just four of seven from three. Just seven three-point shots out of 26 attempts in the second half. Uh, first half, two for 13 from three. That may be an indicator that, hey, guys, stop shooting those three-point shots. The two-point shots, if you make two of them, are better than the, the the one that you miss. So the exact opposite of the uh, the metrical re- metrics revolution in college basketball. But hey, that <laughs> may be West Virginia. Uh, turnovers, 18. Yeah, probably going to happen, I would think. But they also got 19 points off turnovers. They forced 17. Rebounding margin, yeah, plus 17. Um, actually gave up a lot of offensive rebounds, 13. That's not great. But second champ points had 17. Their bench, Chris, 40 points. Points in the paint, 32. Here's the word that I think you're going to hear a lot of. And it's come up a couple of times. And if you're offensively inefficient, it's important. Transition. They had 15 fast break points. That was like a month last season. Couldn't do it. And they get like 17 assists on 28 baskets. Yeah, 18 turnovers, but 17 assists. I think you have players who want to see the offense go and know that it might not be best in my hands. It might be best in his hands. And then that person would be like, well, I'm over three from three. I probably shouldn't shoot this. Maybe it's not best in my hands. It's best in his hands. And the ball goes around the world and maybe gets to the right spot. But um, I think maybe fewer threes, especially they realize that it's not their thing. Get the ball in the paint instead. Live off the offensive glass. Use your bench and try to score easily when you have a chance. That sounds pretty familiar to when they've been at their best in the past. It sounds like things that they were not especially skilled at last season. And they can do it this year. I also look at the the way that they split up the minutes. Twelve players played. Um, no, eleven players played. I'm sorry. And they all played at least twelve minutes. The the low end was Jimmy Bell, twelve minutes, but started the high end Emmett Matthews, thirty one minutes. Um, a lot of players, a lot of minutes, a lot of guys running in and out. I just wonder if you if you tripped and fell and you had all the box scores in a stack of uh and a stack in your hands at the end of March going to the NCAA tournament, and you try to sort them together, and you got it out of order, would this one from the first game of the season fit into one in the middle of December, January, February? Maybe. Maybe. But history tells us probably not. I mean, I think, uh, like, Huggins likes to uh, – well, maybe mid-December, but, yeah, once you get to February, he likes to tighten up that rotation. And I'm curious how it will play out as it moves on and as Perez gets added. Uh, yeah. Whenever he does get added, because again, some some foul trouble played into that. I think you know Stevenson only played 18 minutes. That is not. I don't think that's going to be the normal for him. Uh, he picked up two quick ones early and and was slowed down. Um, yeah, the the rotation's going to be something. But I think the good thing is as long as you can keep everybody's mind right here, 
about their role is that you have options. You are not in a position where you are, you are in a position, excuse me, where say Keaton Johnson is off to a bad start, gets a couple quick fouls. You're not just screwed. You're just like, okay, well, you know, uh, Tucson's going in. And, and if Tucson gets in trouble, okay, all right, Seth Wilson, you're in. You're going to be doing some more stuff. Stevenson, you're going to handle the ball a little more. Uh, you have options. And I know, I think every year, oh, this is so deep. This team is so deep. Oh, 10 man rotation, 12 man rotation. I think this is a, a team that actually, I mean, nobody's ever going to truly do 10, 12 man rotation, at least not successfully, at least not usually. But this is a team that has the options, that has the ability to fill those gaps when need be. Because I think they got some good players. I think. I think those guys that are the 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th player on this team, what was it, in the early days of Press Virginia, that was that was Huggins' thing. Like, maybe our starting five isn't the best, but our 10 through 12, mm-hmm. 10 through 15 are better than their 10 through 15. And, and I think they're back to that this year. A couple things I want to circle here that we'll get to after this. Um, there were three teams last night that came back from 19 point deficits or more to win games on the opening night of the season there were a lot of uh, what does Rothstein call it um, epitome of brutality home teams losing buy-in games um, there were just 32 19 point comebacks last season there were not nearly as many opening night opening weekend uh, shockers that I felt like last night don't have the map in front of me on that one but it just felt like there were a lot of oh my gosh Oklahoma lost at home. That's the only Big 12 team that a win right now. So, hey, West Virginia, not in last place. That's good. Crazy things can happen in the openers. It's a lot of experimentation. I think especially now with the portal and just the emphasis on getting veterans together on the floor, in the locker room, all that stuff, you're going to see crazy stuff at the start of the season. West Virginia's next opponent is, is kind of one of those teams we'll get to before we close here. But put it all out there and see what happens and and – Again, they trailed for 27 seconds. Yeah, 27 seconds. Never gave up more than a lead of more than a run of 6 0. Had a 15 0 run, led by 19 late. It could have been a heck of a lot worse than this and could have been a heck of a lot uglier, which is fine um, considering where the we're, we're, we're talking about ceilings and, and, and basements, so to speak. There's probably a, a lot of room for both of them there, too. So, again, not, not terrible. Not impressive. I get it. But found themselves by just kind of being themselves a little bit. If you're trying to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to look, well, hey, it's pretty familiar, but that might have also been part of the plan too because they want to be tougher. They want to have veterans. They want to kind of push people around a little bit, and they did too. I am just kind of captivated by the roster size. You're going to be at basically 15 scholarship quality players when Jose Perez arrives, and again, the plan is to have him eligible for the first games that he's available for in the second semester, which I think we said, what, December 19th is the first game, right? Right, somewhere around there, 18th, so, 19th. So, not going to play 15. I would be very surprised if Josiah Davis plays this year. I think the plan is probably to redshirt him. Um, so, 14, let's say. On on most nights, most nights, you could play 12, maybe 11, 12, right? So, is this a team that could be 11, 12 and be effective? Is this a team that's 8, 9, and 10, you know? And again, the difference between 10 and 11, not much. The difference between 10 and 12, a little bigger. But a starting lineup, a couple bench guys versus a starting lineup and a second lineup is a big difference here. I don't know that they know the answer yet. Maybe what they want to be is one thing, but which is it? They want to be a very impressive team that has a core of, again, eight, nine, maybe 10 guys. Or do they want to be a team that comes in waves of 10, 11, 12 guys? Do they know what they want to be yet? Do they know which is best for them? Do they know how they play with each one? And then who is it? And to me, it's kind of a difference of, you know, Josiah Harris has been good. Can he continue to just develop as a true freshman? Um, didn't have it last night. What happens with when Perez comes in to the backcourt minutes? Kobe Johnson last night, 15 minutes, two for two, didn't do anything else. And again, is that indicative of anything? No, but like that's a 6'5 guard coming in. Kobe Johnson is a 6'5 guard, right? He's playing a three right now. There, there's a handful of swing guys here who are going to be in charge of how long this bench is, how deep this roster is in a while. And again, we don't have the answer, which is cool to me. We'll see how they get there. But the direction they take, the size of their rotation, to me, is going to be a fun one to track. For those listening, just for for your purposes of understanding where it's at, 
13 scholarship players. That's the maximum allowed, plus mm-hmm. two walk-ons, the walk-ons being Josiah Davis and Jose Perez. Again, so basically you have 15 scholarship players, it, 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 just not in name um, or in practice, I guess. So of those 15, 11, we said, right, 11 played double-digit minutes last night. The ones who did not play, King, who was a healthy scratch. I keep an eye on that one. Uh, Sumnik, who has been hurt. So, I mean, he looked, hey, I never know what it is or how hurt they are, how close they are to coming back, taking it easy. He, he, but he, he was, the, the good news is, for those that were watching, he was up jumping around on the bench, mm-hmm. um, excited about the game. I think one of the Emmett Matthews dunks, he was almost out. I mean, he was on the court celebrating, jumping up and down. He's so excited. So that's good that he's, he's able to move like that. Um, and then Josiah Davis, as you noted, likely to redshirt. And then Jose Perez, not yet with the team, but expected later. So that's that's where we're at of, of who's playing, who played in the first game, who didn't. Um, but yeah, 11 of the 15 with two guys presumably unavailable and Perez and Sumnik uh, Davis likely redshirting and then King, a healthy scratch. King, just I don't know anything, not so I'm not saying anything, but I would just watch that one there because didn't play very well in the exhibition game, didn't play at all last night. They got everybody in last night um, and had a chance late because they opened it up a little bit, didn't get in. Wonder what's going to happen there. Um, this is just the reality of the roster. Guys want to play. So if it's not him, it could be somebody. He's just like, I want to play. And if you're bringing in another guy and he's going to be on scholarship or he's going to be on scholarship eventually, at least the minutes aren't going to be there. What what do I want to do? And people might have to ask themselves that question. We'll see. Um, another question, Chris. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to see lineups with uh, James O'Conco and Jimmy Bell together? Jimmy Bell um, coming out, Mo Wage coming in, playing with James O'Conquo. And then just, oh, by the way, at the end of the game, Huggins wants to play Mitchell O'Conquo, Bell, Mitchell O'Conquo, Wage. Two bigs is back. And three, because Mitchell, Mitchell's like 6'9", looks like a pretty nimble guy for as big as he is, but I don't think he's ever going to be a five here, but like he could be a three or four. They, they're, man, they gotta have a big front court again. Um, I mean, this is not going to be Culver Sheway, but it's also not going to be Kerrigan Polycap either. Yeah, in my in my preview, one of my questions that I asked myself was, will there be some three guard lineups? Will there be some two big lineups? And I said yes to both because I just don't think Huggins is going to stray too far from what he knows and loves. And he knows three guard lineups and he loves two big, big man lineups. And we saw it last night. Um, I didn't hate it. I mean, I think I think part of the reason I don't hate it is because it is different than Culver Sheepway. The problem with Culver Sheepway is that it just clogs up the lane because neither one of them had a game that translated outside of the paint. Um, So you were your only option was high, low post, high post, low post with those two. You weren't swinging one of them out to the um, out to the perimeter to catch the ball unless you were having them come up to screen. And still, even there, you're going with a screen. And typically when you're doing a ball screen, you need the lane clear, except the other big man's in the way. So I, I did not like the two big man look with those two, even though those two were arguably the two best players on the team, two of the better players on the team. Um, but this is different because Okonkwo can get outside. He is not – he doesn't look uncomfortable out there. Not yet. Uh, again, competition is going to ramp up. We'll see if that sticks. Uh, Trey Mitchell is an outside guy. Like, he is a big in the sense that he's 6'9". That's about it because he is essentially, uh, a, you know, a wing forward. Uh, he, he likes to hover around the perimeter. He likes to shoot threes. He likes to start outside in with his offense. He likes to get the ball on and then drive to the basket. He does not like to post up as much as he likes to get it out on the perimeter. So putting pairing Bell with Mitchell or pairing uh, Wagee with Okonkwo or Wagee with Mitchell, I'm okay with it. I kind of dig it. You go three and you lost me. <laughs> yeah, I think you've lost me because that's really going to be tough. Speaking of tough, mm-hmm. observation, Chris. Yes. This is not an observation. West Virginia was soft last year. That's the head coach's words, not mine. 
and they sought to fix that, which again, get older players, get guys who have an age, get big guys, get junior college players whose van rides and cheese sandwiches have given them kind of an exterior that fits with what Huggins wants to do. But they certainly tried to do that. Twice now in two games, they have had their bluff called a little bit, I think. Um, West Virginia wants to be tough and wants to have some swagger and wants to be the bully on the block because it did not go that way last year. And again, when they're at their best, hugging these teams are brutish. They are. They, they drive people crazy sometimes because it's rebounding, it's defense, it's playing really, really close to you and annoying you. If you can remember the old Huggins adage about the press, imagine walking down the street and someone just throwing their hands in your face and knocking you around and jostling you. Imagine doing that on a basketball court where that's uncomfortable. So anyways, they, they kind of want to be the agitators. And they've done that against Bowling Green in the exhibition and then last night. And I wasn't sure that either team, either team was buying it. Bowling Green definitely didn't. Um, they kind of got into a tussle. There was, I believe, a technical foul in that game. I can't remember, but like I knew something happened. And Eric Stevens was like, yeah, I love it. I'm always going to do that and get in the middle of it. And then last night, same thing happens. Like, there's an elbow thrown. There's some words exchanged. Stevenson's, like, surrounded by Mount St. Mary's players. Uh, I want to watch this because the next game is going to be very heated. We can get to Pitt in a minute here before we close, but it's going to be heated. They're going to get into some high-level competition here. And I think if you're West Virginia, yeah, you want to be that way, but teams saw you last year and were like, that's not these guys. Are they real or are they fake? Let's see. I don't know where it's going to go. I'm not predicting a brawl or whatever, but... Again, dynamics to watch, West Virginia asserting itself, insisting it is not what you've seen or witnessed last season. But are other teams going to buy it? Like if someone gets in their face, are they going to laugh? Are they going to push back? I don't know. Something to watch. Um, they want to be tough. Do other teams want to believe it? Don't know. Let's go to Pitt. Not literally, literally. Maybe. We'll see. But they opened their season last night. Easy win. Be careful of the box score on this one. I know they win, uh, let's see, what was the final score? 80? 80, 80, 80 points. To 58, yeah. Yeah. Um, no John Hewley. Good player down the post. And then just a weird roster for them of guys that I'd forgotten about. I didn't know were there. They have some players back there, more experienced than ever, but that's going to be home. That's going to be tough. Don't know if Hewley will play, but that's a double double guy in the post. So Bell, Gay, Okonkwo, they're going to have to have it if he plays. Panthers are a tough team, a good first test here, I guess. Well, second test, but good first test on the road first week of the season. What do you think we have to learn and we should learn about them on this one? Uh, at one point, it was early in the game, West Virginia, I think it was maybe the first TV timeout and posted something about there being more turnovers and more missed shots than there were points at that mm -hmm. point in the game. And at the same time, one of our pit guys tweets out what's happening in that game. And Pitt was four of 17 shooting. And they had held UT Martin to two of 14 shooting. It was something like it, they had got basically they had gotten off to a similar start. And all I thought was, boy, Friday night's going to be fun. It's just mm -hmm. going to be there's going to be a lot of bad basketball, not bad basketball, but defensive basketball. I don't expect a lot of points. I expect some. A lot of rebounding. It's going to be important. And I don't know if I'm joking or not, but uh, keep an eye out for the Federico Federico yes. revenge game. Uh, for those who do not remember, Federico Federico was the guy that West Virginia wanted from junior college originally um, and, and took a commitment from him, everything, and then decided they wanted Leggy and Jimmy Bell. And kind of pushed Federico out like, Hey, you're not going to be on this team. You're not going to be on this roster. You're out. And he goes and <clears throat> goes and signs with Pitt and he is starting for Pitt and went for 13 and seven last night. Um, so again, I don't, I don't think, you know, their, their fourth or fifth best player is going to be the, the difference maker here, but that's just something, a little side note that I'm certainly going to circle for this game um, that I, I think is going to be determined in the paint, on the boards, and on the blocks. Yeah, they only out-rebounded the opponent 33-29, UT Martin. Um, interesting. They had eight guys shoot a three. They were 11 of 41 from three. 11. And, yeah, Federico's an interesting one to watch. Um, the big name, the big number here, Blake Hinson, and I don't know if people remember this, but kind of look him up. He sat out at Iowa State the past two years. 
um, was a good player in the SEC at Ole Miss, I believe, like a double digit guy his first two years. Didn't play a whole lot or at all, actually, the last two years. First game at Pitt, four of 12 from three, but he gets 27 points, 13 rebounds. He takes 18 shots in eh, 33 minutes here. But his first game after sitting out two seasons, that's a bullet they did not have before. They were not a great shooting scoring team last year. All of a sudden, he gets 27 the first game. Uh, how they guard him, how they deal with him, that should be an interesting watch there because um, I'm assuming that if Hughley isn't there, or even if he is, that's like an outside-in combination, inside-out combination where they can work together, that's fine. But, I mean, it's a 6-7 wing who who can do some things and um, should be a good matchup for West Virginia's two, three positions here and how they attack the perimeter. But uh, not bashful, 12 threes and, again, 27 points, and they kind of gave him the green light in his first game. There must be something that they like. We'll see. Uh, that's a road trip. Peterson Event Center. Second game, first week of the season. And then something is happening Saturday, Saturday. Oh, Oklahoma. Maybe the last time against West Virginia Big 12 football. Period. End of conversation about football. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's make this a basketball-only podcast. What do you have I going up on the site here, Chris? Because well, today I have is one Tuesday. more thing to add for that, oh. that pit game. Oh. Sorry. Right. Um, just something to watch. Because we sat there and talked about how, was it 11 players played at least 12 minutes in West Virginia's deep, and maybe they're taking the approach of our 8 through 12 is better than your 8 through 12. Pitt doesn't have an 8. No. They might not have a 6. Um, they played five guys over 25 minutes last night. Um, five other players saw the, the court. Okay, they did. A couple of them, two minutes, three minutes, seven minutes. They were up 30 like just a few minutes into the, the second half. So it was prime garbage time, play anybody you want. And all the garbage time in the world, and they could still only get a couple other players in for a couple minutes. Like this is a team with a seven-man rotation, maybe eight. Again, like this is this is a game where West Virginia's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 – are going to be drastically better than Pitt's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I would not be stunned. I mean, I the approach I would take, uh, you, you do know I coach eight-year-old basketball, so I, I have some experience here, mm-hmm. is to is to push te- – it's going to be tempo. It's going to be – it's going to be – I would be putting as much pressure as possible on this Pitt team because they just don't have the depth to, to play that type of game. No. Uh- I would be very surprised if Hughley plays. That guy's been out for like maybe five or six weeks and hasn't done anything. Like he's Trey Mitchell wasn't practicing, even though he kind of was. I don't even think that Hughley's been doing that. So that's like a that's a load under the basket. That's probably not going to be there. They got another uh, important bench guy, William Jeffress. He's played. He's like a part time starter, but plays a lot. It's about twenty minutes a game. Uh, I believe he's out for a, a while too. So two more rotation guys that may get back there. Don't have to worry about it on a Friday night. So yeah, yeah. short bench. Let's see what happens. Jeffers, now, Jeffers and uh, Hewley, both guys that uh, West Virginia really wanted, really liked uh, out of high school. Good players like them. No hard feelings, I'm sure. We'll see. <laughs> um, Tuesday, football day, Neil Brown News Conference. We'll ask questions about the Oklahoma Sooners. Back on the website, plenty to preview that, plenty to review basketball. We'll have a little Trey Mitchell story up there. Spoke to the media about his journey from one school to another and then through a foot injury that apparently came out of nowhere. And then uh, you have some tricks up your sleeve, too, correct? Yeah, we'll have some more recruiting coverage. Uh, again, Neil Brown stuff, the usual. Uh, I'm going to touch in base with our Oklahoma site for a preview. Um, new quarterback offer. I'll have a story up with him in the next day or two. Kind of depends on what news comes down between now and then. Uh, a new junior college offer of a defensive lineman that West Virginia is trying to get on campus in December. Um, a very fluid situation, obviously, with all this recruiting news and what's going to happen and who's in the class and what they need and and who's going to visit and when um it all depends on on the basketball team right it says it's basketball pod let's just stick with that yeah it's a basketball podcast one and oh like i said one down 30 to go road trips conference games invitationals between other conferences a lot will happen between now and then, and again, part of the uh, enjoyment here will be the journey about how they figure out who's going where and how they're going to get there. Stay tuned. We'll try to figure it out with you. Until then, I'm Mike Casaza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We'll talk to you then.